So take it away, Eric. Everybody what do you want that? to talk about today? Just recording the meeting. Um, well, it's really what everybody else wants to talk about. I talk about this stuff every single day. Uh, um, so a couple of Thursdays ago, you had one of your twice weekly sessions and, um, and there was no guest. There was just kind of a open, open conversation. Yep. So I just wanted to get on and see, uh, <laughs> see how you guys interacted, you know, when you didn't have a guest and I got on there and you became um, the guest. <laughs> and they jumped all over me, which is great. So uh, we had a lot of questions. Yeah. And um, well, your big thing and, is paper. Uh, you know, we can review some of those. So getting getting started with the papers. So I'm going to ask an actually simple question on matte papers. How do you tell which side is the print side? Uh, well, there's a couple of ways. Uh, the first way that I usually did it, but I've changed now is just like in the dark room, you know, most, you know, uh, silver halide emulsion uh, will stick. If you do the you go inside of your lip, it'll stick to the inside of your lip. The non emulsion side or the non coated side won't. But then Veronica, who's on, and she's the uh, West Coast uh, uh, sales manager for Hana Muley, she showed me the, uh, the post it note trick. A post-it note trick is pretty cool. So if I get a matte paper over here, uh, let me get a matte paper. So here's a matte paper. If I go on the back side, it just kind of pops off, right? But if I go on the emulsion side, it has more resistance. So it'll stick more to the emulsion side of a print. Nice. So the emulsion or the uh, coated side for inkjet, um, it's designed to suck, you know, I mean, mainly ink, but it sucks mm -hmm. everything. So, uh, so there's a way to tell. Uh, one of the primary issues, I mean, there's a lot of commonly asked questions that I get, but one of them is, hey, I just made a print and it looks awful. I mean, there's just no black, the colors are kind of drab. And I'll say, turn the paper over. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, turn it over. You've printed on the wrong side. And while you know the manufacturers do kind of as an industry standard, put the paper face up in the box, they'll even might have they might even have a sticker on it that says print this side up. You know what? Doesn't always happen. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, they hired monkeys that day, I don't know, and paper goes in upside down and 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 that causes a problem. So, so like I said, there's the lip test that I call it, where you just touch it to the inside of your lip and you're, it'll stick a little bit. And then, of course, Veronica's new post-it note procedure, I think, works really well as, as well. Hey, Susan, Susan's on. And Robbie's on. Well, there's just Sorry, all sorts of people coming on now. No, I'm not leaving. So, yeah, can I ask people Ian? in the audience to mute if they can? Well, they should also ask questions as well. Right, but they can unmute to ask a question. But if, if they're talking to other people in their room. Right. So there were, um, I was actually, I'm not surprised from uh, the previous Thursday's talk about the questions because the questions that were asked are the same questions that are always asked. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that the industry of all of the things yeah. that uh, they educate about, and try to make us better at printing is not one of them. Mm -hmm. And my mission in life is to be able to help people get ink on paper and make it look amazing. And I'm not sure why the industry just kind of overlooked printing as a uh, as an evocation. I mean, um, I've been at Freestyle now for 34 years, so I've got a very long history in the industry. And I've got to say that, you know, when digital photography was invented, I think that um, that person that first looked at a computer, an image on a computer screen and said, hey, that looks really cool. We don't have to print anymore. That was the, the tipping point. That was the domino that caused all of this disruption in the industry. Because if you remember, you know, there was a but there were photography stores on every corner, right? When I first started Freestyle, there were 
I know I heard statistics, 20, 30,000 photo dealers in the country. Wow. We had a photo marketing association. There's no photo marketing association because there's no photo market anymore. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to associate. So that person that said, oh, that's really cool. We don't have to print anymore caused this huge disruption in the industry. And when I was younger, and certainly when I first started Freestyle, where we didn't have any computers whatsoever, um, we were only selling darkroom supplies. The, um, there were ever so many commercial labs in Los Angeles, and certainly every major city in the country. Uh, there were mini labs in every, every, in every mall. Uh, there were signs all over the place. We proudly sell Kodak film. We sell Fuji film, Agfa, Konica, whatever. Um, we had photo mats in the parking lots of every, you know, every mall in the, in, you know, in, in every city and it's all gone. Why? Because that act of you going to a store, talking to people you liked that were qualified, that you could call friends and you would buy a roll of film, you would have it processed every single image on that roll of film would be printed if you paid a couple of extra dollars you got double prints and you would put it go you get done you'd see your prints you'd be all excited you'd buy another roll of film and you did it again that's what kept this industry healthy without that look what happened photo deal i mean we probably have a couple of hundred photo dealers now it's not thousands it's not tens of thousands it's a few hundred and our industry in terms of equipment it's a consumer electronics industry now and we kind of predicted that at freestyle you know back in the year 2000 when you know we i think that we all agree that about the, the year 2000 that's when digital photography became viable and popular and at the same time People were, you know, predicting the death of darkroom. And we as a company doubled down and we focused on uh, connecting with the various uh, remaining or, you know, uh, I mean, Kodak, a lot of the big coding facilities were still around, but we knew that the big companies weren't going to be able to shrink into the size that the market would become. So we partnered with smaller companies like FOMA and Photochemica and, and others to continue to make those products available and really focusing on schools and encouraging to have a um, um, have confidence that those products were going to be uh, continue to be available and to teach continue to teach wet darkroom yeah. so now as far as I'm concerned a lot. Concerned on a lot for sure. uh, whoever's talking in the background you should mute uh, Michael Newler has got his finger up. Does that mean you want to ask a question, Michael? <laughs> yes. Is that your signal? Okay. That's my signal. Good. Go ahead. Either that or I have to go to the bathroom. No. Um, um, you don't have to raise your hand. You're an adult. You can get up whenever no. you want. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't accuse me of being that. Um, one big downfall of wet photography <clears throat> was the federal government. And it had to do with all the chemicals going down into the drain. So the large photographic labs and the uh, processing labs that the federal government owned had to switch, completely switch because of the, uh, the massive amount of chemicals being put into the drains and then into the rivers and into the ocean and whatnot. That's the first thing. Uh, hold on, hold on, Michael. Uh, yep. Before you go to the second thing, uh, every lab I know has sophisticated filtration machinery that- They had to. They had well, to yeah, because, but that's, because of the rules but, and regulations. And, and the other thing is you're partially correct in that, you know, yeah, wet darkroom, a silver halide photography was horrible for the environment. It was always very surprising to me to see all of these you know, photographers like Ansel Adams and such be environmentalists, yet, you know, photography has never been the healthiest thing for the environment. And now, you know, talk about the environment. Look, we got these computers and there's heavy metals in the circuit boards and the plastics and everything. Look, uh, 
you know, we're going to get really depressed if we start talking about how great photography is for the environment. So go on, number two. Uh, but just to backtrack, uh, those, those chemicals and those plastics and those circuit boards uh, are only, once the computer is made, that's it. When you bring it into your home or your office or your studio, uh, you're not dumping out all that, all that stuff. The second point, <clears throat> the printing manufacturers, in other words, the, the Canons, the Epsons, the HPs and, and whatnot, their philosophy is no different than the uh, uh, Gillette razor. Basically give away the printer, make the money on the paper. Or the so they, they uh, well, the printer it's make the money, give away the printer, make the money on the ink for the ink for and the, the paper printer manufacturer. Mm -hmm. The paper manufacturers are separate, except Epson really, from a marketing standpoint, ties likes to tie the paper sales to the printer. But okay, I'll give you that. The <clears throat> they don't have a, a really uh, altruistic attitude to teaching the people how to how to make prints, quote unquote, correctly. That's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, but <laughs> but yes, you're right. <laughs> but if every print that somebody made out of a box of I don't know Hammermule or Moab or whatever, all right, came out perfect, then you'll be selling less paper. I totally agree. That's okay. why I, I'm considered a rebel. <laughs> I want if I if I want you to make 10 prints and I want those 10 prints to be absolutely perfect. I do not believe that photography is in any way fun if you're making 10 prints to get a good one. So my whole reason for being as a professional, as somebody who works for a company that, yes, we are in business to sell stuff um, uh, in order to stay in business. But I truly believe that if, if I can help people achieve greatness and, and provide them with the tools to create their art and with a unique artistic signature and do it well, um, I've contributed. I've contributed positively to our art, to our industry. And it makes me feel good that when people come to me say, I have a portfolio because of you. I'm getting more shows, I'm selling more work. If it's a college or university streamlining, you know, their systems and having them understand color management so their students are producing better work more quickly so they're not spending too much money or uh, or more money than they need to on on paper and ink it's all about paper and ink so and none let's of it take this cheap. now and go toward getting that those perfect prints say and that again John? let's let's go toward making the perfect prints what are some of your tips where to start i think you the choice of paper is your starting point for you isn't that um well there are six steps to making a perfect print for me um, and certainly paper is one of them. I'll get to it. It's the third one. So okay. the, first, the first step is using a monitor that is correct and appropriate for editing photographs. And 90% of my customers have um, Apple computers. Um, since I've been doing this, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm running more and more and more people that have Windows machines. But at least, uh, and it's not the same around the world. Around the world, in certain countries, there is a uh, higher propensity for people to use Windows machines rather than Macs. But for some reason, in the United States, Apple computers have dominated the market. And unfortunately, Apple doesn't make computers for photographers, at least not photographers who want to print. If you're editing for the web or you're editing for digital content, uh, all of the new Apple uh, screens, uh, laptops, even their new $5,000 monitor, uh, the new LG that they're promoting. They're all P3 color space, which is not the, the color space that we use for digital fine art printmaking. We use Adobe RGB 1998. Um, all of the Apple computers made prior to 
2015 are all sRGB monitors, which is a much smaller color space. So um, also Apple monitors are bright, they're glossy, they're contrasty. They are optimized really for streaming movies from iTunes. That's, their, that's really why they're, they're manufactured. And they're for the 90%, they look cool. Um, Apple has been the quote, uh, computer for creatives, but when it comes to digital fine art printmaking, we need a bit of a different monitor. So the brand that I recommend is BenQ, uh, and they have a photo view, uh, photo, a photographer series. They also have a designer series, which is less expensive, but the photographer series, um, all the monitors, which are four in that line, uh, our Adobe RGB 1998, at least 98%, which is kind of our standard. They come with viewing hoods, so you can focus your eyes on what you're doing. Um, and the choice of which one to get depends on kind of the connectors and the size of the monitor you want. And the resolution, a lot of people go, oh, I need a 4K monitor. Well, not for still photo editing. 4K is great for video, uh, but if you're doing photo editing in Photoshop. Um, I haven't tested the new version of Photoshop, but you can't scale Photoshop. So as an older person, when all the little tools and letters in Photoshop become microscopic at 4K, I've got to back the resolution to two and a half K. So I definitely recommend BenQ as a value brand. Um, certainly there's NEC and ISO, which are much more expensive. Um, and if you've got the money, by all means, but I really support BenQ as, um, as a great value brand for Adobe RGB 1998 monitors. They're also matte, um, so you're not getting all the reflections. I'm using one now as my primary monitor. I have it connected to my MacBook Pro and I'm using the new uh, SW270C, which is USB-C connection. Plugs right in my laptop. It actually powers my laptop handles the video signal, and there's a hub on the back of the monitor that uh, converts one USB-C port into two USB uh, 3.0 ports in an SD card slot. So you get a lot for your money in that brand, and especially in that model if you have a, if, if you have a newer Apple laptop. Uh, the second thing is uh, calibrating your monitor. Um, I have been in talks where the person who is... Um, who's the presenter says, you have to calibrate your monitor. There is no negotiation. There is no option. You have to calibrate your monitor. Now, I try to take a little bit more of a kinder, gentler approach. And all I, all I can really say is that a calibrated monitor is definitely better than a non-calibrated monitor. And the reason is simple. You know, one of the most common calls I get is my prints are coming out too dark. I must too need dark. to calibrate yeah. my printer. I don't think I've ever in my entire career had anybody ever call me up and say, my prints are coming out too light. It's never happened. It's always too dark. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that your monitor's too bright. So the, the reality is that, you know, this is color management 101. If your monitor isn't projecting color accurately and at the right brightness, you have no hope of ever getting anything out of a printer that looks anything like your monitor. And the proof of it is this, look at your monitor, make a print. If it's too dark, lower the brightness on your monitor. The print's not gonna change. There's no information that goes from your monitor to your printer. People think that just because what they're seeing here and they're pushing buttons and somehow that goes to the printer, uh -uh. what happens actually is your file is on your computer. It then gets sent to the, to the monitor. Your file's on your computer, it gets sent to the printer. So color management, those two words that strike fear in the hearts of every, every photographer is the way we get these two technologies that are totally different to match up to a standard. So when we calibrate our monitor, and the next question is obviously gonna be, what do I recommend to calibrate a monitor? I recommend the X-Rite i1 Display Pro. And do you and have a recommendation for the brightness, like 90 to 100 CDM squared or 110? So the industry standard is 120K. 
Candela's, which is CDM squared, which mm -hmm. also there's NITS, which is a new term that we have adopted in photography, uh, which has been commonly used in video. NITS is kind of the same thing as a Candela. There's Lux and Lumens, right? So all four of those measurements are calculated differently, but they end up being the same thing. Mm -hmm. So um, the nit rating of, you know, you'll see, oh, my new iPhone's a thousand nits. Well, that's super bright. Yeah. And we're going to be printing, our standard for printing is 120 nits. Now, um, when I educate people, when I instruct people, um, when you buy an x i iOne Display Pro from Freestyle, it comes with a manual that has been written personally by me and rewritten and rewritten so that whoever buys that device will get a hard copy manual and know exactly how to calibrate their monitor. Now, the brightness issue has to do with viewing, right? So um, I don't know if any of you online, I've only, I can only see you 20 at a time. Uh, there's about 55 here. people. Yeah, there's a lot of people like, hey. Um, <laughs> Uh, for instance, uh, you know, I'm, I'm friendly with all the, you know, guys up in Carmel Monterey working with uh, Huntington Witherell, who some mm -hmm. of you might know, I know I um, set him up with a whole system, uh, brought up a BenQ monitor, didn't want it. He was using these little 24 inch old Apple cinema displays that were really yellow, mm -hmm. but he liked it that way. Hunter likes to work the way he wants to work. Yeah, I asked so, Hunter to come on here, actually, and he said, no, I can't do it because I work with stuff that's like 10 years old. I don't want to upgrade my computers or anything. I just oh, want to do my work. Oh, that. I mean, he's got, <laughs> he's got a computer that's Snow Leopard. It's running <laughs> Snow Leopard. Wow. And he does not want to update anything because if he does, he's going to lose like $10,000 worth of equipment, right? Mm -hmm. So he's so focused on never upgrading he has another apple tower in a box ready to go when his dies <laughs> and he'll just clone it over he's never going to update anything wow but i went up there set him up with everything plugged in the monitor it looked beautiful but he goes no i want it to look i want that monitor to look how my studio is lit he's got these tungsten bulbs right it's a little dark so I teach people the standard 120 candelas D65 um, for the the um, color you know, temp. Uh, white point, yep. um, and then all the check buttons, all the drop down menus. The manual is very specific. Um, I've played with that device. It took me a month to figure out how to really work it so that a monitor would be perfectly calibrated right? Uh, professionally calibrated. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want your monitor to be a little um, darker, go to 80, go to 100, your choice. The whole point is to make it so that it is comfortable for you so you can use it to make what I call predictable, reliable, consistent, and repeatable results. Every print you see on my back wall here, every print I ever make for anybody is one print. Now I might make a print, see something in it and go, eh, I gotta make a little tweak. But what I see on my monitor comes out of my printer every single time. Mm -hmm. So so we went through the first two. We have- I have a question. Uh, yes, uh, go, okay, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, um, as far as the light in the room that you're working in, mm -hmm. um, and you're saying to use a hood for the monitor. If you don't have a hood for your monitor, how do you recommend the room should be lit for when you're working? Um, that's because number six. That I'm getting, no, you're, you're ahead of me. That's number six. Oh, you're getting there. Okay. <laughs> Will that also cover um, the setting up the your um, I write your ex, your uh, calibrator to adjust for room temp room brightness or where um, do you go good there? Good question, John. I am not there. Look, this is a all of these questions that are going to be asked, including this one. If you ask a hundred photographers the same mm -hmm. question, they're going to give you a hundred different answers. Right? right. And, and it frustrates me because I spend a lot of time correcting misinformation that's on the web. Um, I spend a lot of time correcting information that's old information. I can't tell you how many people are looking at videos that are 10 years old. 
right? And mm -hmm. and they didn't look at the date and they think that the printer that was around 10 years ago is a current model. So uh, in terms of measuring the light in the room, I do not do that. And I do not encourage people to do that because it can change all the time. Now, I have a pretty stable environment here. I have blackout curtains on my windows um, and my walls are neutral. Uh, and I've set up a viewing environment that's the right color temperature and the right brightness and such. But um, there are photographer or people in color management that will tell you to measure the ambient room temperature and light and others that do not. I am really most, I am worried about what's coming off the monitor. I'm not worried about what's around here. Some people will say, and I guess I'm gonna get to Anne Marie's question here since it came up with, with John, not because of John, but it's really more for Anne Marie. Anyway, sorry. Um, uh, people say you should have a completely black room. Well, that really is hard on the eyes from a contrast perspective. Um, I like it to be subdued light, definitely not bright sunlight. There shouldn't be bright sunlight on your monitor. But I'm worried about what's coming off the monitor less than I'm worried about what's around here. And the viewing hood that the BenQ monitors come with really help focus your eyes on your monitor. And that's what I'm really concerned about. So, but, you know, if somebody, if, if measuring the ambient light with the uh, colorimeter works for you, do it. It's about comfort level. Right. So, um, so the third thing is paper and really my whole conversation, the way I teach, the way I talk about printing is really focused around uh, what paper you're going to print on. And the reason is that when I started all of this as a conversation, um, it was at a time I'm talking about 10 years ago where um, we had really established ourselves as kind of the center of the silver halide, you know, black and white darker market. We were connected and still are with all of the remaining coding facilities in the world. Uh, people were calling me all the time, top photographers in the world. What products being discontinued? Is Triax going away? What's going on with Plus X? You know, what's happening with Ilford? And also from an education standpoint, I've always been very experimental. So I tried, you know, every film, every developer combination, knew what all the toners did. I was the go-to guy that if you wanted to know what combinations of things would result in a particular um, unique artistic signature, you know, from an education standpoint, people were naturally gravitating towards me. Then colleges and universities started calling, look, we're, we're teachers. They give us budgets for equipment, but they're not teaching us how to print digitally. So they would take what they learned in the darkroom and start doing test strips on inkjet printers, which is if you're into color management, there's no reason for a test strip, but they ported what they knew in the darkroom to digital. And it was difficult, a very difficult transition. I had, I had commercial labs who were wanting us to carry uh, roll paper because they were tired of dealing with the big commercial uh, paper houses, not knowing their materials, not knowing paper, shipping them product and then having it get damaged. They, you know, it was a whole just a supply chain issue where people wanted us to be a reliable source of products, um, not only from an education standpoint, but just simply from a availability, you know, have what I need when you need when I need it. And then uh, professional photographers were asking, questions and then just regular amateur. I mean, I deal with a whole cross section of the industry, but people started asking, what paper should I use? What printer should I get? How do I get best results? And from a personal standpoint, you know, I had this great reputation on the darkroom side that I was very proud of, but I didn't have the same level of knowledge on the digital side that was commensurate with what people thought I knew. I mean, people thought I knew everything. They still do. And I to be honest, I don't. I'm always learning. I'm always experimenting. I'm always bringing new things into my classes and presentations. I, I definitely make an effort to evolve. So um, I went on a personal journey of exploration because the answers that I was getting from the industry, back to Michael uh, Newler's comment that the industry has not been very altruistic in terms of teaching us how to print, 
I would go to professional photographers that I knew as a young man at Freestyle in his 20s behind the film counter, knowing that when a, cut, a photographer came in, that I knew exactly what they were going to use. They were, somebody would come in, I'm getting 10 rolls of tracks, a bottle of Rodinol, a box of Oriental Seagull paper, a pack of Dectol. You know, I mean, they used what they used. And oh, sorry, sorry, sir, sorry, ma'am, I'm out of tracks today. I've got HP 5 plus, I've got Forte Pan 400, I've got Orvo Pan 400. I've got, you know, HP 5 plus or HP 5 back in a day or HP 3 back, you know, whatever. <laughs> we had a dozen different 400 speed film. Nope, I want my tracks. I'm not using anything else. I know it, it's reliable. It is, I have tested and tested and I have a group of products that equates to my unique artistic signature. I will not take anything else. Those very same people were coming in in 2010, and I would ask them, oh, um, you're printing visually now? Yeah, I am. Uh, what paper are you using? I don't know, whatever the lab uses. It was so frustrating to me that we went from an industry that was brand loyal, that was loyal to a group of products, a grouping of products that we knew, that we tested, that, that had a result that was our unique artistic signature to, I don't care anymore. And that's what kind of the industry has done. We, we now think of uh, what I call is the good enough equals great mentality. And I was talking to a, a customer yesterday who, you know, it's very easy to pass off a mediocre product and call it great if you've never seen, great. And I've heard the conversations um, on this group, you know, in past conversations where people are using Bay Photo and Millers or um, on that day I was on, I ended up, um, you know, where we had that brief conversation in the morning uh, early. And then as the conversation progressed, uh, the gal was talking about her frustration of not being able to get back from a lab, what she was seeing on the monitor you know what I get every day, all the time? I have sent my work to six different labs and I've got six different prints back. Why? Why isn't there just one standard? That's because everybody thinks they know what they're doing. And there is a standard. And really, if everybody was working with the same standard, we'd get the same product back. But everybody's got their own method of doing things. When you send your work to the bigger companies, the uh, images get processed through um, uh, image balancing software and stuff and rips and all sorts of things. They're using all sorts of different profiles. Really, who knows what you're gonna get back? Um, to me, the best print that you're gonna make is the one that you made, the one where you've controlled the entire process from beginning to end. And I personally feel that there's no greater pride that one can have by saying, look, from the moment I push the button to the moment this print came out of the printer, it's mine. So, so papers, um, I found that based on my experience in the darkroom, the quality of my prints were directly related to the paper I was using, whether it was Oriental or Ilford or, or Forte or, or any number of you know, products or Burger or, or Ilford, Kodak, whatever. Um, there were lots of papers within a particular brand. Some were warm tone, some were cool tone. We had different textures, you know, different surfaces. You know, back in the day, I was a really big Ectolor fan. Uh, I used Agfa Pan 25, processed and rolled in all one to a hundred. I mean, I did all sorts of different things. And Eric, it's ne Eric, it's Niku. Can I quickly ask you a question? Um, sure. I have a whole bunch of my students who are first time photo students on the call and they're, they they're listening no, to They have that. no idea what I'm talking about. They have about, no right? clue what you're saying. <laughs> um, so I want to give it, I, and again, they're, they're first time photo students. They're studying digital photography at CSUN. And um, to, for context for all of you, Eric is brilliant, incredible, 
super top level printer of all printers and knows all paper and these digital technologies and he's incredible and he's made incredible prints for me and, and I can't say enough about him. But what Don't I want to ask- Don't go any further, him, his prices will go up. <laughs> he's, he's amazing. I can't say one, one bad thing about Eric. He's fabulous. But what I'd like to, what I'd like to ask is, and he could, he should, his prices should go up. Good for you, Eric. Um, so my, my question to you today is, what do you say to students who are, you know, they're, they're like just starting out. They're picking up a digital camera. They're stuck with, um, you know, mostly they start with cell phone pictures and now they're really learning. They're, all of them have DSLRs. They're learning their DSLRs. They're doing great. <clears throat> what do you say, where is the place of printing? I mean, I, I know where it is, but I want to know what your place of printing is for them. And, um, and kind of what, what you might say to, what you might say to them um, in the case of where we are now. Uh, is it still, I mean, I think it's still precious and amazing to print and to see our photos like that on paper. But what, what, what are your thoughts? Just just so that they they kind of understand it was that okay and by the way hi um, i miss you i i'm sending you a big virtual hug thank you um yeah, let me gather a couple of thoughts here because <laughs> it's a good segue question because it's really vitally important like i said earlier you know the kind of the destruction internal you know from the inside out of our industry has been caused by the fact that you know, we're really taking more pictures than ever before in the history of photography, but we're printing less. And I know, that's a it, shame. And it comes that's down to what huge. happens as we get older. Do we pass on our phones to the next generation now? You know, what happened to photo albums? How many people enjoy sitting down with pictures? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a generation of people that are going to be wondering about where their pictures went, mm -hmm. right? I mean, their digital files have the archival permanence of a sand painting. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you're one hard drive crash away from losing everything. You're one powerful magnet away from corruption. And, you know, when we had film, film might fade, but you can get it back. Digital file corrupts. I think Dennis Keeley told me that one day. Film fades, but digital corrupts. Mm -hmm. And you get, a you get a file you can't retrieve the data on, you're done, right? So to me... You know, as much as the industry is 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 snippy snappy, it's fast. Things got to happen. We got to transmit those files. And yeah, I've been in conversations with colleges where I'll be in advisory board committee meetings, and there'll be a photographer there saying, "What are you worried about printing for? I haven't printed in twenty years. You know, I haven't delivered a print to a customer in thirty. You know, whatever. These are the things for me that are important. Number one. If you have an image on the web, I don't care if it's Facebook or Instagram, you have no idea what people are seeing. The only way that you can control what people are seeing is by making a print. It's yours. If you're looking at an image on a computer screen, it could be too light, too dark, too green, too blue, too yellow, too contrasting, not contrasting enough or cropped. You have no idea or control over what people are seeing. Everybody's monitor is different. Not everybody has a calibrated monitor. And even at that, the environment's going to be different. So to me, printing is about controlling your process and controlling what people see. Uh, two, you can sell a print. Okay, you might shoot a job and they might pay you for the digital content. But once that gets out there, you don't have a lot of control over it. I mean, yeah, you could sign a contract or whatever. But a lot of the discussions I have now are based upon people stealing the content off their website, off of various websites, stealing your hard work. A print is something tangible that you can sell. And there's many people that are on this call right now who are selling their prints. Um, that's what collectors are going to buy. That's what a museum is going to buy. Um, mm -hmm. I, my specialty is helping people uh, create what, you know, and people use the same three words, gallery, museum, exhibition, quality prints. That's what I teach and promote. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, in the last call that we were, that it was on, it was a couple of Thursdays ago, Nico, where I just kind of hopped on to a general discussion for this group. Uh, 
Ian was talking about prints on metal, uh, dice sub prints on metal, and face mounted acrylic prints. Those are decorative products. You could sell a lot of them, but galleries and museums are not going to accept those as fine art gallery, museum, exhibition quality prints. Um, the other thing about printing is this. I can absolutely attest to the fact that printing makes you a better photographer. You will see things in a high resolution print that you will never see on a computer screen. I don't care what computer screen you have, it is a lower <clears> resolution <throat> than what you will see in terms of dots on a piece of paper. And, and the type of paper really allows you to control the process that you can't on a computer screen. A matte paper looks different from a glossy paper, from a semi-gloss. A resin coated or a metallic resin coated print looks different than a, a, a matte paper on William Turner, for instance, you know, which has got the texture of an 80 grit sandpaper. And when I shoot every image, um, and there's just a sampling of images you see behind me of my portfolio, which is about 200 prints, um, which are individual images taken by me and printed by me on every single paper that you know we carry at, at Freestyle. Um, when I shoot, I pre-visualize that image on the paper I'm going to print it on. I know when I shoot what that final image is going to look like because I integrate the unique character and personality of, of paper into my composition. And when people look at my images, they're very surprised at the choices I've made because rather than just shooting and focusing on one paper, I've got to know everything. And uh, we, pro, um, we provide a service uh, that's called an inkjet paper psychotherapy session. And many of the people that are on this call that I see have participated in it in, in the past. And, uh, and I do them remotely now. Uh, it costs $99 and it's an item on our website. And people send me a file. Uh, we'll, we'll have a conversation, talk about the papers that you think you like and don't like. And I got to be honest with you, 90% of the time people who say, I hate semi-gloss paper. I don't like the reflections. I only like matte papers. Make some pr prints for them. And their work doesn't really look good on matte paper. It looks better on semi-gloss paper. They'll change their mind. And the same is the opposite. People say, I don't like matte papers because the images never look three-dimensional. You never get rich blacks, blah, blah, blah. Done well, printed correctly um, and professionally it might actually be better. So to me, paper is the most important part of the process. Printing is the most important part of the process. It makes you better. It's just like Nico, when your students are in the dark room, they're learning skills that they would never learn digitally. Digitally, um, and I think, you know, Michael will agree, will insulate you from the you know, from the obstacles that you would have in the dark room. But because dark room isn't easy, it forces you to be better. And I think printing digitally also forces you to be better. Whether you're a photographer that's only ever going to deliver a digital file, knowing printing, having printed, being knowing the process translates over to you as a photographer. And uh, for those of you who have purchased big printers, I think you'll all agree, you see things in your prints big that you didn't see when they were small because everything gets amplified. I've got images where there was like a little piece of fluff in the image and I didn't see it when it was small, but when I blew it up to 24 by 30, like, what is that? Oh, I got a piece of dust on the, on the print. I got to do another one. I do another one. It's in the exact same spot, but I never saw it on a computer screen. Mm -hmm. So I guess my advice with regards to printing is do it, you know, either do it at school, get a printer, even a small printer. Um, it will benefit the lessons you will learn will benefit people. you. Do you have some small affordable printers for students that you really recommend? Um, well, like, I'll type them into the chat. Affordable or relative terms, right? Well, um, yeah, but you understand my point. For a student, for a student who's who's studying photography at their rates, or something that you can recommend, not they're not going to buy the five thousand dollar or three thousand dollar Canons, right? Um, well, you don't need to buy a 
three thousand or five thousand dollar cannon to get great results, right? I mean, you know, the market has uh, strategically targeted printers at various levels. So, you know, at the very low end, you've got your multifunction printers that you're going to get at Best Buy or, you know, Staples or whatever, and those really aren't um, appropriate um, for what the type of photography that I focus on. Um, they're good for just putting resin coated paper in and making prints of your family and friends, but it's not really going to give you a lot of control. So, you know, uh, our two major brands are Epson and Canon. Uh, Epson right now in the 13 inch range has the P700. Uh, I think they're $700. Um, it's a smaller version of the newly introduced P900. Um, I think that's from a budget standpoint, uh, just from a price for the printer standpoint is, is it's a good value. The only problem with all of the 13 inch printers is that your cost per milliliter for ink is twice as much as the larger printer. So whenever I talk about printers, which is really number four, which is you know after monitors, monitor calibration, paper, then we go to printers. Um, it's picking a printer that's appropriate for your lifestyle and your pocketbook, obviously. So I have a lot of people that say, well, I, just, I don't wanna spend a thousand dollars on a printer I just want to spend this much on a printer. It doesn't come with very much ink. Um, and your cost per milliliter is about $1.50 per milliliter. When you get to the P900, which is $11.50 now, and we're just starting to get them in, um, the replacement cartridges are twice as big and your cost per milliliter goes to 85 cents per milliliter. So I talk in terms of uh, you know long-term uh, investment. So yeah, the smaller printer is less of an investment initially, but in the long run, it will cost you more because you're going to be buying more cartridges and those cartridges are comparatively for the ink are going to cost more. So in the Epson, it's the P700, P900, P900 is 1150 right now. Um, if you can find them, they're in very short supply. On Canon, there's a new P300, a Pro 300. I have not seen one and I'm not a big fan because it has 14 milliliter cartridges in it. I mean, it's tiny. And again, your cost per milliliter is a dollar is a dollar 50 per milliliter. Um, the pro 1000, I think is a much better value at $1,300. And that's really kind of your minimum for what we're, what I call it's a, you know, technically it's a pigment based printer which is designed for creating archival pigment prints. Now the Canon also has a very popular printer called the Pro 100. It's been out forever, but it's a dye-based printer and they're about $500. And yeah, you could do some good stuff with it, but- um, Which is that one, the $500 option? What was that again? It's the Pro 100, but it is a dye-based printer. Um, and you don't have the same- No, it's a, it, that's a Canon. Yeah. Yeah. No, she said Epson. No, it's a oh. Canon. Oh, did I say Epson? I'm yeah, sorry. She, no, she Canon did. Pro 100. Um, I think it. the same I, thing. I'm typing Epson, it in the chat. Yeah. I think the Epson side is the uh, the Expression XL 15,000 or something. I think that's what they call it. So you it. might want so, to touch on the difference between dye and pigment here for, for people but, who don't know. Sure. So dye is basically colored water with lots of optical brighteners. It's not designed for archival permanence. It's designed for you know, somebody who is going to be uh, doing occasional prints and they're not really worried about, you know, how long <clears> they're gonna last. And while the manufacturers will make all sorts of claims about longevity, the reality is that those tests have been done in a laboratory environment, not in a normal everyday environment. And uh, things like ozone that comes off of your, you know, that is um, leached from your refrigerator, you know, the free on your refrigerator, pollution, um, all sorts of other things affect dye uh, very aggressively in, uh, in addition to just UV light. So I really promote uh, for the bulk of my customers um, pigment, which is ground up stuff in a solution that is much more resistant to fade than dye-based prints are. So I really focus more on the pigment-based printers than I do the dye-based printers, but they have their place. Um, and um, you know, and a lot of people, especially uh, on the Canon Pro 100, you know, when you buy a camera and a lens, that's the 
you know, with all the rebates they usually give on that printer, people get them for like a hundred bucks. And then they turn around and sell them on eBay for 130, make a profit. <laughs> so uh, yes, Michael. Um, the larger cartridges that are all coming out now, for the average person that's gonna print, professional or, or whatever, um, how quickly do the, do, the, uh, do the nozzles clog up if you don't use it every day? Um, so my general advice to people on printers is the more you use them, the more use you will get out of them. So it's not necessarily an everyday thing. I mean, the reality is these printers like to be used and most of the issues that are related to clogging um, uh, are because people don't use them, right? So the less you use it, the more issues you're gonna have. Now, um, a lot of the complaints that people have had on printers are on the older printers. Uh, Canon uh, with their thermal print head technology where the head heats up before it prints, it basically dissolves debris on the print head. I'm not gonna say that you'll never get a clog on a Canon printer. I know that there's people on here that have Canon Pro 1000s and Pro 2000s, et cetera, where, you know what, yeah, you're, if you let it sit or just at random, you're gonna get a clog here and there. Uh, traditionally, Canon printers have not clogged, uh, don't have the same level of clogging issues as Epson's, but, you know, in a lot of the classes that I am uh, teaching now, I'm surveying people that have had Epson P800 printers, which is the last generation of Epson printers. And they're not having nearly the same level of clogging as they used to because Epson's putting coatings on the head that are helping to alleviate that problem. Um, I can't say anything about the new Epson P700 and, and 900, other than the P700 I have at Freestyle, which honestly haven't been there much, you know, um, haven't been doing a lot of demos in the store at all because of COVID. Um, I'm going there, you know, every few weeks I'm doing a nozzle check and it's coming out clear. I haven't had really any clogging issues with it. But then again, you know, on the wide format printers, you know, I've had people that, you know, on an Epson printer, um, P7000, for instance, they've had the printer a year and two months and the print head shot, they have to have it replaced. And it's a very costly repair on an Epson printer, on a Canon, um, it's a fraction of the cost and uh, you can replace it yourself as opposed to an Epson where you actually have to have the head replaced. So. The answer to your question is I generally, the short answer is I generally tell people to print once a week, um, but people don't. Some people will print for three months, then they'll go on vacation for three months, they'll come back. You know what? They might have to do a nozzle check and a head cleaning. But the, the issue is not as um, prevalent as it was on the previous, you know, on the printers of 10 years ago, like the 3880, 3800. Yeah, talking uh, about clogging in the like, Cheryl's brought up the the, the question of the day, um, third party inks in the chat. Oh, she's just trying to piss me off now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, third party inks. So there's there's been a lot of chatter uh, uh, on the internet about third party inks. And I've got to tell you, it's, it's an issue that I, I just think it's, um, I think it's very foolhardy to, to go down that route. And the reason is this, one, it's not easy. I mean, you've got to zap chips, you've got to use syringes, you've got to fill these cartridges for what? You're going to say, what, 10 cents, 20 cents? I mean, there's not that much ink that gets squirted on the paper. I mean, you're talking about a milliliter per square foot. How much are you really saving? Two, I have seen so many printers just get absolutely destroyed, destroyed by third party ink. Plus, there's really not very much consistency. I mean, the Epson and Canon do not share their proprietary uh, ink manufacturing techniques with third-party companies. The consistency isn't there. I, I mean, every video I've watched from people who promote <clears throat> it say, oh yeah, you've got to reprofile every time you put a new cartridge in. Really, you've got to go through that much effort you know, and then I've seen so many printers just get destroyed because the way that pigment is ground 
you know, the way that product is manufactured, you know, that that is proprietary information. It's not shared. So, you know, these companies say things like it's a virtual match. Well, virtual could be this much. It could be, I mean, what is virtual, right? So the other thing is, you know, and this gets back to what Michael was saying earlier about, you know, they're selling the, you know, giving the razor away for free to sell the razor blades. If everybody bought third-party ink, you would not have a printer, period. There would be no incentive for Epson and Canon to make their product if everybody bought third-party ink. You're being a bad citizen by not supporting the manufacturer that's making your product. So that's my being a schmuck too (laughs) for yourself, because if you if you use a third party ink, your printer is going to go to hell in a handbasket. I want to get back to something that uh, for Nick, uh, Nikki is her name. Nikki. 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 Yes, Michael. So do these students uh, need or want printers for uh, to use in school or for their homes? No, I I asked, I let my students, I saw this on Facebook and I love Eric and I thought it would be a fun break in the routine of class for us to come and listen to this photo talk today. I don't know if these students want printers. They're all, um, you know, these students are are doing a digital photo class, Um, but I will give this plug to be thinking, we have printers at school. So CSUN has Digital printers, I, I think, Eric, you might have even set them up. Is that accurate or sell them to CSUN? Yeah. I believe they come from you um, yeah. and they're Eric approved. CSUN has a number of digital printers, but we're in, you know, in the schools, we're in pandemic times. So nobody's in the schools. We're not using labs. Right. We don't have access to anything. And, and the truth is, it's really hard for someone who's learning photo now to understand the benefits of a print, um, especially because we live in such a crazy digital world and we're constantly throwing out digital images. But I, I do wanna give this plug to printing that you don't ever truly know what you're working on until you put it up on a wall and live with it for a while. Okay, Cindy. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to know which printers you now like, uh, you currently like for professional print photographers. And also I want you to complete your five and number six. The, the by the what? Complete five and six, but what is your favorite printers right now? Okay, so um, for, for pro use. Okay. So um, Cindy and others know me as a very big evangelist for Canon printers over the years. Um, and for various reasons, including, you know, all the objections that we've ever had of Epson printers. So the, at the very bottom level or base level uh, for a desktop printer, uh, the, on Canon the Pro 1000 is a great device. Um, it's got the same print head, the same ink set as the larger printers. Um, as you can see behind me, I have a Canon Pro 4100, uh, which is the 44 inch printer. It's our best selling printer, mainly because it's a great value. It comes with twice the amount of ink than the 24 inch printer does. So when you look at the price difference, especially now with the rebates they have going on, the amount of additional ink that the 4100 comes with, if you have the space to put it in your place, um, it's the difference in terms of the in, in terms of the price difference of what the ink comes with. So it's like $1,200 worth of additional ink and it, co- and it costs $1,200 more than a Pro 2100. So uh, we sell far more 4100s and 2100s. We sell the 2100s uh, to people who just don't have the space for a 4100. On Epson, you know, one of my big complaints has always been the fact that you've had to switch ink between photo black and matte black. Um, the new series of desktop printers from Epson, the P700, and P900, you no longer have to switch ink. And so far, my tests on the P700 have been very positive. Um, I have not physically seen a P900 yet because of COVID. There have been severe disruptions in terms of distribution um, and shipping of various products, including printers and the inks. So, uh, but I've got very high hopes for the P700 and P900. Um, They... 
Um, the P900 is actually 30% smaller than the P800 was, uh, which is great. I give them very, uh, give them kudos for industrial design. They look like little um, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey <laughs> obelisks on their side. The little light, the LCD panel, <laughs> Epson print layout is a great program uh, to make. It's kind of an easy button for printing that you can use as a... Um, uh, a plugin for Photoshop, uh, not Photoshop and Lightroom, just Photoshop or a standalone application. But I continue to also be a very big supporter of Canon printers. They are our, by far our best selling uh, line of printers at the moment. Uh, and, uh, and then the new uh, large format printers from Epson to 7570, 9570. Um, I have high hopes for those as well. So, um, but um, at a, you know, from a, a history standpoint, a historical standpoint for me, um, always had a very, very close relationship with Canon. I'm a beta tester. Um, Arthur and I are very close. Uh, you know, whenever there's a new printer come out that comes out, they send me one to see if I can break it. <laughs> and I also work uh, very closely with them on the software. So. Well, uh, Anne-Marie, did you have a question? Emory, can you hear? Huh? Did you have a question? You had your hand up before. Oh, uh, I had, it was really a comment, not a question. Um, huh. Regarding uh, something that Niku uh, said about her stu about printing uh, and having it hang on the wall for a while to live with it. I think that is the key important thing for a photographer, a real photographer to have a print is first of all, it's very important in the editing process as well. If you're working on a series and you hang them on the wall as opposed to looking at them on your computer, there's a big difference. I mean, you really can't get the feel for the flow of your image to image if you're working on a series mm -hmm. without having prints on the wall. So I think that is very important to, to tell your students. You know, uh, you. there's somebody on the... Uh on the Zoom call, he's on the front page. He's actually got the Paul Lynn spot on Hollywood Square, <laughs> right in the middle for me. It's Ravi, uh, Ravi Kumar. And he's got a project where he's going to India and he's taking pictures of a temple there and he's got very unique access. And, uh, and he has a, a wide format Canon printer. Uh, we met up in, uh, uh, up in the Bay Area, up in uh, Monterey. We did a uh, talk for uh, a CPA and he um, and he's doing a beautiful series of images where he goes to India and he takes pictures of this temple, goes there several times a year, and he brings them back prints to see. He doesn't show his images on an iPhone or an iPad. He's showing them prints, and they love those prints. It's something that's special. It transcends anything that you could see on a computer screen or an iPad or an iPhone. And, you know, I go to shows and people say, let me show you my work. And they bring out their phone and I'm like, <laughs> really? Where's your print? Where, where's the thing that you control? Yeah, Cheryl uh, seems to be wanting to show something there. You're muted, Cheryl. There you go. There's nothing like holding your own work on a beautiful piece of paper. There really isn't. And just not just the look of it, but the feel, the weight. And I think Eric was going to move on to paper and paper is so important. And just the feel. And I always carry physical prints with me all the time. It's not the same looking at a, you know, a little tiny, there's a big difference between looking at a little cell phone and feeling mm -hmm. a print on a beautiful piece of 100% cotton paper. So, so Eric, uh, Eric, just quickly, thanks for the plug, but uh, I got to tell you that they had to really twist my arm to loan them soft copies of just one or two images because I told them I'm not giving it, you know, while work in process. Uh, but they saw my print, which is obviously custom profile that you did. Uh, they took it to their professional guys. And the top of the administration came back to me and said, how come my prints don't look like yours? <laughs> I'm gonna interject something here. This is Ian. Um, there's a, there's a business aspect to, to printing. 
um, that I think the students especially might be interested in. Because, um, you know, everybody wants to be a photographer, but at some point in time as a career, you have to make money at it. Uh, I've been always a primarily an advertising and um, uh, editorial photographer, very extensively published. Some years back, uh, Canon came out with the IPF 5000, which I bought. And I used it primarily, uh, number one, to proof my work uh, before I shipped out the digital files on very important projects. I'd print them up at 17 by 22 and look them over. And I also used it as a marketing tool. And I'll give you an example. There was a publisher in New York uh, in my industry, uh, published five magazines. And I became aware of the fact that the man did not use email, did not use a computer. His secretary would just print things out and hand them to him, be it emails or anything else. So obviously sending him photos by email, we're going to lose, lose a lot of impact. So I printed, uh, five 17 by 22s of, th of what I knew he would like. And I sent them to him FedEx first overnight. And I had a phone call within an hour from him and uh, went on to shoot for his magazines. So there's a business aspect that can be uh, accomplished with printing uh, that can uh, have a lot of impact that you might not have otherwise. I, cool. um, I also have to say that you know, in our HF paper psychotherapy sessions, I have performed that service for, I can't even tell you how many photographers over the course of the past eight years or so. And, and I have had uh, grown men and grown women, once they see a print, come out of that printer on the right paper, printed as, as well as it can be, <coughs> hold it in their hands and they cry. It, I have, it's an emotional experience when you see a print, your work printed well on a piece of paper. And, um, and I don't see that happening with images on an iPad or an iPhone or a computer screen. And so, so there are a lot of benefits and some of them are tangible. Um, like Ian said, I mean, I know photographers that They'll do a shoot and the customer will say, I, I just want the digital files. You know what? They make one print and hand it to them. And they go, you know what? I, I really want prints. It's people have forgotten. And, and, and what I do in terms of education is I'm just remember, reminding people what brought them to the dance to begin with. It was really prints. So, um, okay. So we'll get, back to certain things I'm sure but so five um uh five is uh, having custom profiles made for your printer you can't calibrate your printer okay there are certain things we could do on a canon printer to equalize uh multiple printers get them to a certain standard using a color what's called a color calibration procedure it's not a custom profile so um, i have people that call me up and they say i'm using a canon pro 100 die based printer 500 dollars I'm using Canon Pro Luster paper, resin coated paper, just for everyday use. It's a photo grade general purpose paper, not fine art paper. So putting everything on auto and they will tell me what comes out of that printer, I'm getting the best gallery exhibition using quality prints you've ever seen. Now they're using the Canon Pro 100, they're using basically an inexpensive resin coated paper and a manufacturer's <clears throat> generic profile all of those terms are mutually exclusive from being able to say you're producing a gallery, exhibition, museum, quality <laughs> print. So those are the three words everybody uses. So what we mean by custom profile is, um, I'm gonna grab, this is a uh, color patch chart. Uh, we use at Freestyle a Barbieri Spectro LFP, which is the Rolls-Royce <laughs> best quality calibration device on the market. Uh, this is 2,108 patches, and uh, you would print this uh, file out. You can also, we also make it available in 28 and a half by 11s. You print it out on the paper you want to profile on the printer you're using, and it becomes, when we send it back to you after we scan in the patches, a custom profile for your printer on that paper. Now the philosophy here in terms of all color management, whether it's calibrating your monitor or a printer is color management is 
math. Everybody is afraid of it. Everybody reads too much into it. A lot of people that talk about it make it very complicated. It's math. So I use an analogy um, to talk about color management because I think it's important because it can make, I mean, it's one of those terms that when you say color management, people's eyes roll in the back of their head and they're like, we don't, I don't want to talk about that. That's too complicated. Well, it's really no different than anything we've ever done in photography. So um, I wear glasses. I see some of you wear glasses. I'm sure that many of your glasses are prescription, right? Guess what this is? This is a profile for your eyes, not my eyes, not your next door neighbor's eyes, not your friend's eyes. This is a custom profile for your eyes. That is the difference between how your eyes see and how they're supposed to see according to the standard of 2020 vision. When you're calibrating a monitor, the software is flashing colors. Your color emitter is reading those colors. And at the end, it says, okay, the monitor, we, we're setting it to whatever our brightness is, 120, 100, whatever you choose. 120 is industry standard, flashes the colors. The software reads those colors, compares them to a lookup table and prepares a file that is a calculation according to the ICC standard, whereas this is the standard according to the, you know, meta, you know, the ophthalmological <laughs> industry of um, to get my IC 2020 vision, right, or better. Um, a custom profile for your monitor is the difference between how your monitor's projecting color and how it's supposed to be according to the ICC standard, which is the International Color Consortium, which is a group of companies and individuals who established early on what color is. And there's a mathematical number associated with every color that's on that chart and every color that's flashed on your computer screen. The difference is a file that's a custom pair of glasses for your monitor and what this would do is be a custom pair of glasses for how your printer's printing on that paper. So when the manufacturers provide you with a generic profile, it's like going to Walgreens and getting readers. They're for everybody. It's designed to get you okay, but it's not for your eyes. And what I've seen, and in fact, when I teach and I teach at the Los Angeles Center for Photography, um, I do workshops all over the country when we're able to travel, obviously. Um, I do, uh, Canon has me at their learning centers. I also do uh, workshops for Leica. If everything's set up properly, what you see on your monitor will look like what comes out of your printer. Because your monitor's set up to be projecting color at the correct brightness according to the ICC standard, and your printer's now set up to print on your printer on that paper according to the ICC standard. Now we have two devices that can communicate separately to a particular standard, which gives us control. And that's it. It's not rocket science. It's nothing to be afraid of. If you do it right, it solves a lot of problems and it saves a lot of money. And when I teach, one of the things I do when we get to the color management part is I have people print with generic profiles on the printer, on a paper, and then I have them print with custom profiles that we've created. And the custom profile prints are always better. Now, honestly, yeah, we're using a machine that it's only, uh, its only purpose in life is to create custom profiles. It is $10,000. You don't have that device. Yes, there's other devices on the market that do do custom profiles. Um, but, you know, you're looking at consumer grade de devices that don't do as good of a job. And, um, and there's limitations. We charge $99 per profile. It's far less expensive than buying a $500 device or a $1,600 device or a $2,200 device or a $10,000 device. How many profiles are you really gonna make? And we make sure that they're correct. 
So, um, so custom profiles to me are the least expensive and best way to improve print quality. And it has to do with shadow detail, color accuracy and black and white, it's linearization and neutral grayscale. And I got to tell you, the images with custom profiles always have more depth and dimension on any paper than any generic profile. Ravi, yeah, uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, so based on what you just said, and I haven't used this before, we don't need to do soft proofing, correct? Because if the translation is done by the profiles, we just uh, don't need to do any no. soft no, you have to, you, well, in soft proofing is a technique or procedure that gets you one step closer, right, to being able to predict what uh, your results going to be. So if you're just looking at your monitor and what soft proofing is, for those of you who don't know, is when you're in Photoshop or Lightroom or any of your printing programs, there's generally a soft proof feature. Um, in Photoshop, it doesn't say soft proof. There's, there's a, uh, it's under the view menu. Um, but what you're doing is you're applying the paper profile onto what you're seeing on your monitor. And that gets you one step closer. So when you're editing your images for printing, you should always be working in what I call the soft proof environment. A matte paper is gonna have a very different profile and color gamut versus a glossy or luster paper. So, and every paper is a little different. So um, uh, I hate using words have to, must have, need, right? There's a lot of people out there that have uncalibrated Apple monitors that never soft proof, they make prints, they're happy, right? But soft proofing is part of the color management procedure and it is a necessary part of having your reliable, consistent, controllable and repeatable results. Uh, and you should be applying that profile that you're going to be printing on, right? Uh, as you're editing your file. Okay, thank you. So, um, so that's number five and number six gets back to Anne Marie's comment, which is lighting, right? So um, uh, at Freestyle, we have this horrible metal halide light in the office, uh, or sorry, in the store. And uh, when I work with people, they'll see a print come out of the printer and they go, oh, big shot. That doesn't look like anything like what should be on the, what's on the computer screen. I go, ah, wait. <laughs> and then I put it in a GTI viewing station and it looks exactly the same. So the quality of the light that you're viewing the print under is important. Um, and uh, Essentially, 5,000 Kelvin or D50 uh, mimics bright sunlight, high noon. That big yellow ball of light in the sky, while it looks yellow, it's actually a very blue light. And that's our industry standard. And that's what we should be looking at when prints come out of the printer. Now, there's an argument that people will come to me all the time with, which is, well, I don't know where people are gonna be viewing the print under. It could be tungsten, it could be 6,500, it could be all sorts of different things as well. My issue is it's gotta look good somewhere. So I have Philips Hue lights on tracks. You can see here, I can uh, adjust the color on them. I have a, uh, what's called a Lumu, which is a color temperature meter for my iPhone. Um, and I've adjusted them to 5,000 K and um, 120, Lux, which is the same as a candela. So I have a steel wall with magnets where I could look at prints and, and look at them accurately. Why so, not 6,500? Uh, 6,500 is, uh, why do you ask? Why don't you say 5,000? 5, 5,000 is our industry standard for looking at photographs. Now, if you want to look at them under 6,500, you could, that could be your standard. But our standard as an industry is 5,000. Interestingly enough, and Arthur would disagree with me, is I, when I calibrate my monitor, I calibrate it for D65. But when I look at my prints, I look at them at D50. Why? Because there's something wrong with our brains. And I find that D50 looks too warm on a computer monitor for printing. Okay. Um, but D6, uh, D50 um, is more for proofing for the printing industry. 
Um, some people will say, well, if you do it for D50, your, your mind will get used to it after a while. I think it's too warm. Again, this is where we get into different strokes for different folks, right? Yeah. And we have all of these options. We have a million options in Photoshop for doing different things. And if you ask 100 photographers the same question, it'll give you 100 different answers. So and Jim points out in the chat there, and then the people put their photo on their accent color wall. Correct. <laughs> so yeah, I've in fact, uh, there's a group on Facebook where it's a printmaking group and the guy's got a terracotta wall in his studio and i'm like no why did you do that <laughs> my wife wanted some color in the studio so you know um you know every a lot of things affect our perception of color there are people that will say you know i'm drinking coffee here but i'm not editing photos you should never drink coffee when you're going to edit photos you should never eat hot chili for instance right um you know what you eat affects perception of color. And quite frankly, physiologically, women see color better than men do. You know, I've women... also noticed that between my eyes, I see different color. You know, if I close um, one eye, then the other, I see a slight temperature change. Well, you might have a, you might have the beginnings of a cataract, mm -hmm. right? Cataracts I remember that too, as a kid laying in bed and, and I would look out and I'd see different colors between my different eyes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you have a good eye. And so when you look at prints, do you do, do you look at <laughs> no, I let it blend? <laughs> you know, the neat thing with the Philips Hue lights is I can adjust the color temperature. So I could look at them under 3200. I could look at them under 3600. <laughs> I could look at them under 500. Um, I know some artists that, you know, they will, when they print a show, they will take color temperature meter readings of the lights in the gallery and make an adjustment in Lightroom or Photoshop so that they look right in the gallery. Uh, a few years ago, Cheryl and I were at a uh, show in Hawaii called Photocon, and we were printing, uh, creating prints on site for the booth. We didn't want to print the big prints and then have to mount them later on and stuff. So we had a printer with us. We brought paper. Prints were coming out. They all looked green. And she gets there going, oh, Mr. Fancy Pants, why are prints coming out green? I thought you were some sort of an expert. Well, I happen to have a GTI light box with me. <laughs> Took a snippet off, put it in the box. It was perfect. Why? D50. The lights <laughs> in the convention center were 3,200. I measured them with my Lumu. So I went into the light room. I made an adjustment for the white balance. My next print was absolutely perfect. It was dead on. And every print I made after that was dead on because the lights in the convention were different. Problem is people got the prints. If they looked at them somewhere else, they wouldn't look right because they were <laughs> right <laughs> for the convention center. So, so the color temperature and quality of light definitely matters. So that's environment. Um, and what about environment for printing, temperature and humidity in the place you have your printer? Is that something we can touch on here? Sure. Well, that's some of the things that cause clogging some of the things that cause uh, head strikes, some of the things that cause a lot of other issues that are very, very common uh, calls that people make to me. Uh, people will come to me and say, hey, my prints, um, all my prints are coming out of my printer. Where's my camera? There it is. Yeah. Um, and I got little black marks in the corners, right? And they'll say, oh, there's something wrong with my printer. It's not your printer. I mean, it is your printer, but it's a combination of the printer and the paper, because if the paper is curled up like this, when the print head comes across, it's going to hit against the corner and it's, we call it technically, we call it a head strike. So what you got to do is, uh, and it's caused by, uh, especially 100% cotton papers, it's caused by the absorption of moisture in the air due to humidity. So when you have a paper that comes out of a box that looks like this, uh, sometimes um, what'll work is you just kind of gently bend the corners down without damaging the paper and they will come down enough temporarily so that when the paper goes in, it clears it. Um, Canon uh, on their media settings has a margin, uh, a choice for a margin on their desktop printers where it won't print for the first little bit. Um, you can also raise the print head on a can of printer or just the platen gap on the Epson, but sometimes it curls up so much you can't do anything, right? So um, there's a device called a D-roller. 
which is right here. And we sell tons of them. It's a very heavy metal bar with a piece of mylar in it. And its job in life is to take the curl out of paper when it's printed on a roll. But what I do is I put it face down and I curl it, I roll it up so that it curls this way. You literally get a curl in the paper this way. I put that in the printer and you'll never get a head strike ever. It, you know, they're not cheap, they're 250 bucks, but it huh. saves a ton of paper and a ton of ink and it solves the problem. There's no adjustment, there's no fix for it in the printer. It's, it's a combination of printer and paper. Well, some, some papers, at least on the Canon, force of an area of unprinted area. Um, on the 13 inch printers, the yeah. Pro 10 at least did. Mm -hmm. um, on the Pro 1000, there is, uh, you can have, for the paper sizes, there's two versions of mm -hmm. many of them. There's one that's called eight and a half by 11 and then eight and a half by 11, I think it's five or 30 margin, 30 yeah. margin. Yeah, or art print 30. Print further in, but sometimes it still happens. It depends mm -hmm. on how much, uh, but yes, uh, temperature and humidity can in fact um, affect print quality. Uh, is it enough to visually see? It kind of depends. Um, I have very, on very rare occasion, had to reprofile a paper for anybody um, based on changes in environment. But some of the things that do happen, you know, are the paper swells, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's rated for 310 GSM, but it's going to absorb humidity and it'll get thicker, you know, because of the moisture. And then you'll get head scraping, you know, the print head will scrape on the paper. I've seen that. Mm -hmm. And people do nozzle checks and head cleanings and it doesn't solve it because it's not a clogged nozzle. It's the print head scraping. So you got to raise the print head. Mm. And in the larger printers, you can also adjust vacuum strength. So there's yeah, Jim was asking if the Canon Pro 1000 has a vacuum type of thing to suck the paper down. Uh, it has a vacuum transport mechanism, but it doesn't it's not a, as adjustable as it is in the bigger printers. Um, Jim really needs to get a bigger printer. We've talked about that. Uh, Jim, <laughs> Jim Brock, right? Is it Jim Brock? Jim Brocker? No, Jim, Jim Breaker. Oh, Jim Breaker. It's the other they're, Jim. They're next to each other on the screen, though, right now. Oh, there he is. Jim, yeah, so the, um, the Pro 1000, while the print quality is exactly the same as the larger printers, it isn't nearly as, I mean, it's a prosumer printer. It's not, you know, a commercial grade printer. Uh, in fact, Jim Brock has burnt out a few of them because he does uh, nighttime jazz uh, club type images with lots of black and he run, he does a lot of prints and um, you know, he's got a production issue at this point, you know, a, a, what we call a duty cycle issue on that kind of printer. But, uh, and, and also what he's doing, uh, another issue we haven't talked about is 17 by 25 paper, right? Which is a great size that uh, very few of the manufacturers um, uh, cut. And Jim is actually by 17 inch rolls and cuts them in this by 25 and puts them in this Canon Pro 1000. And time consuming, but that D roller saved my life on that thing. It's incredible to cut, yes. cut a roller. So, okay, other, cool. um, so that was the six things. So it's monitor, monitor calibration, paper, um, printer, custom paper profiles, and lighting. Those are the six steps to perfect printing. And then obviously within all of those things, there's an education because um, I, when I present and when I talk to people, one of the things I tell them is that, look, photography has always been a combination of art and science. And the art part is your ability to capture an image that you're so proud of, that you wanna show it, you wanna share it, or you wanna sell it. And then how you wanna present it. Um, the in-between part, the color management part, uh, the printer part, the print driver, knowing how to operate the machine, all the drop-down menus, all the choices, that's the science part. And that's the part that allows us to execute a unique artistic signature. Um, and again, for me, the focus is paper. And I found that being able to incorporate the unique characteristics and personality of paper 
makes my images transcend from just ordinary images to extraordinary prints. Eric, can I talk real quick about some things regarding what you just said? Yeah, who's um, it? Fikes. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, there you are. <laughs> so you it good? might be, I'm good. Good to see you. Um, it might be the, the half step or maybe the seventh step, but is there a place where as technology moves forward, as we move forward in time, between the OS and Adobe and Canon regarding upgrades. I think you mentioned this and we talk about this occasionally, but there always seems to be some sort of disconnect when something changes. Is mm. there a way to reference, I don't know if Freestyle can do it or because I feel like I'm always hounding you, um, what's the best way when you upgrade an OS or you get the new Adobe or you get the, you know, the, the new printer as far as um, them all getting along, if you know what I'm talking about. Oh, I know well. So, <laughs> well, Adobe, Adobe Max just happened and Adobe updated, you know, their, their new versions of Photoshop and Lightroom, et cetera. And guess what? Your plugins, if you have them, don't get brought over. Adobe is not responsible for your other company's third-party plugins, so they're left behind. They don't get rid of them. They're in your previous plugins folder. The reality is that, uh, and I hate to say it, is that the um, companies don't really talk to each other. They really don't. I mean, they're not giving the people, they're not giving the other companies a heads up. They kind of do what they do. And, um, and I, um, believe me, I wish it was different. Um, everybody wishes it was different. But um, the updates that are going to occur after Adobe comes out with their software are going to come months later after the engineers at Canon see what happened. Um, or even, you know, what happened with Catalina, that, that was a nightmare. Every time anything updates, my life becomes a living hell, um, you know, because things stop working. And the manufacturers, the best they can do is figure out what happened and then uh, create an update. And um, uh, on Facebook, which is where I do most of my communication with the world, I know everybody doesn't have Facebook, but I seem to have a very active and supportive Facebook community. Um, um, I put up, hey, special technical update. Adobe just updated. Photoshop and your plugins are not going to be brought over. You should go to Canon's website and download the latest version and, um, and, and reinstall your, your plugins. Uh, the other thing is once they do an update, you know, there's bound to be some sort of conflict and incompatibility. In a perfect world, yes, everybody would be talking to each other. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case. And I really wish it was. So uh, well, I guess that's my, why I'm here. I encourage people to call me and yeah. I try to contact me and, and help, you know, ease the pain a bit. So, yeah, I get, I guess my possible suggestion would be, is there a way that maybe freestyle can have like a, I'm running this OS with this version of, of Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever, and running this printer, what's the, the secret sauce combo to use to make it work version. Um, <laughs> I wish it was that easy. There's so many different computers, so many different OSs, so many different versions of software and so many bugs. Um, I would rather spend my time doing what I'm doing now, which is helping people individually with their issues and supporting them in their, you know, printing and, and such. But, um, you know, that is you know, people will call Canon if they have a Canon printer and say, what just happened? And the order desk more than likely will help them. Same thing with Epson. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure I really have the time to take on that kind of role other than what I'm doing, which is on Facebook saying, hey, I've noticed that this is happening. And when Canon's released new software that's fixed the bug, I'll put that up there as well. So, you know, um, friend me on Facebook. You know, and I, okay. I things come up. I, I, I try to do that, but um, so many different scenarios, uh, so many yeah. different bugs that are out there. It's, you know, it's really hard to, you know, keep on top of all of it all the time. But I try to. So yeah, I feel like you you're always the go to guy, and I feel like you probably could have a whole full time position just answering those questions. 
Yeah, it's not really what I want to do, though. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, that's I why I was trying to. <laughs> but I like to answer other questions. So yeah. here's some other questions for you. Um, okay. Thanks for monitoring the chat. It's over here. I don't really see. Yeah. It. Printer printer manages color or Photoshop manages color. Oh, that's a great question. Oh, who answered? Who asked that question? I did. Oh, I'm not going <laughs> to answer it then. Okay. <laughs> so um, those two terms are really bad. They're bad terms because they don't really do what they say they do, right? Okay. So, um, and actually both Canon and Epson are moving away from that terminology um, in their uh, print layout program. So mm -hmm. uh, Canon has Print Studio Pro uh, and Professional Print Layout. Pro professional Print Layout is the new newer software that's compatible with all of the new wide format printers and the Pro 1000. Uh, Print Studio Pro is not compatible with the newer generation of Canon wide format printers. It's the Pro 2000, 4000, 6000 series and the Pro 1000. Pro 1000 can do both. Um, and they their uh, choice for what we would normally call uh, Photoshop manages color is use ICC profile, which is really what it is. Um, Epson's doing the same thing in their Epson print layout program. If you just go to file and print and print through the OS, it still says Photoshop manages color and printer manages color. So uh, Photoshop manages color really is you're going to use a specific ICC profile. That's what that is. Okay. And that's how I print all the time. That's how I recommend the print. That's how I teach the print. Printer man manages color just means it's going to reach in and whatever media setting you've set it's just gonna bring the manufacturer's generic profile for their paper. So if you're using Epson mm -hmm. premium luster paper, it just prints using the profile for the generic profile yeah. for Epson premium luster paper. It's an easy button, but it isn't gonna give you reliable, consistent, repeatable, controllable, or best results. How about rendering intent? Oh, I love you. Is that your question too? Is that yeah, that's mine else? too. So rendering intent is one of the most polarizing and confusing and misunderstood choices in the printer driver. So um, the, two, the two that we use are in, in digital printing are perceptual and relative color metrics. Mm -hmm. um, in the older drivers, you'll see absolute um, and saturation, absolute color metric and saturation. Those are used more in the printing industry. So um, we never really make those choices for, for making digital prints on the printers that we use. So both Epson and Canon have um, um, uh, uh, standardized now for those two choices relative mm -hmm. uh, color metric and perceptual. So imagine you have a color space, uh, it's this big, okay? Mm -hmm. They're three dimensional, right? And you got a color that's like way out here. So uh, what perceptual does is it takes the color that's out here and it maps it to the center of the profile and it uh, squeezes that color into the profile because it's an out of gamut color. Mm -hmm. so when the color's out here, we call it out of gamut. So that choice tells the print driver how to deal with the out of gamut color. So you got it out here and it's gonna basically go, it's gonna squish it. It's a harder calculation. Okay, now if the color's out here and you do relative color metric, it's gonna look at the color out here, it's gonna map it to the edge of the and profile, everything. it's gonna clip it off, right? It's just gonna clip it off. So mm -hmm. perceptual brings it in, relative clips it off. And so the, the answer to the question is which one to use, right? And the answer is whichever one looks better. Mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, you know, in surveying photographers over the years, and when I talk about this, I basically say, look, you know, a statistic that I have, uh, it, there's no science behind it. It's just, you know, my own experience. 80% um, of photographers use perceptual, 20% use relative color metric, 99.5% have no idea why they use them. So um, uh, for me, I use perceptual most of the time. Uh, I think it makes the colors in my prints look more natural and it preserves tones in my opinion. Uh, relative color metric, ah, you didn't ask about black point compensation. If you're using relative <laughs> color metric, you have to use black point compensation. Perceptual basically incorporates black point compensation into it. It's basically taking out of gamut whatever, 
bringing it into the profile that you're printing, right? And, and I should have specified, even though I said it was the print driver, it's the autogamic colors for the paper because the papers can't render the same gamut volume that are on our monitors, sure. right? Printers don't print Adobe RGB 1998. They can print a little bit in the Pro Photo RGB, which I know is going to be your next question. No, I was going to skip that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, but um, to me, the testing that I've done when I've had images that I've tried to print where the color is really out of gamut, relative color metric will allow me to render out of gamut colors more accurately. Right. If I'm trying to get like the, the red in the Target logo, you know, Target company mm -hmm. logo or IBM blue, relative color metric is very much used. Now, if everything's in gamut, like you have nothing that's out of gamut, those two choices mean nothing. They're not going to do anything. It only has to do with out of gamut colors. So I use perceptual mostly, and then I switch to relative. I have to. So, cool. yeah, I don't, I don't usually then, go to our pro photo. Other people do the opposite, right? Other What's people that? do the opposite. If you do really know what you're doing, you know, choose relative color metric, right? Mm -hmm. And, and black point composition. Yeah. I was going to leave out the pro photo choice because most monitors can't display. Well, no monitor can, dis there's no monitor on okay. the market that can display pro photo. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and our printers, um, interestingly enough, when I look at, compares when I compare profiles to color spaces. Yeah, the printers actually in the yellows and maybe a little bit here or there can print some pro photo uh, colors, but we can't see them. So there's no predictability. So I generally when I'm printing um, and for everything in general, in general, I will choose Adobe RGB 1998 as my color space. And then if I'm actually going to put an image on the web, I will convert it to sRGB because you know Adobe yeah. RGB is too large of a color space uh, for images that are being you know uh, displayed on the websites. Great. All right, oh. Can I jump in again, really yes. quickly, and ask you? Um, sorry, John, for jumping in again. No, I, have I, that's, I want you to. Thank you. I have another batch of students that just joined. My first class went away. I told my second class <laughs> to join. This is a. This is a darkroom class, um, but we don't get to be in the dark yes. room. So yeah, but we but get this. Oh, group hug, group hug. <laughs> oh, it's so much love, darkroom right? Classes get group hugs. There's CSUN, black and white, darkroom class, and these kids don't get to be in the darkroom this semester. So we have this 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 whole new conundrum, right? Um, so they they're actually they're sending their film out uh, to Richard and they're getting their film back. So they're, they're actually shooting negatives. They're shooting 35 millimeter negatives. They're getting the film back, having it scanned. And then we're dealing with that. So my question for them, it, it just maybe to address for them is maybe the differences between these digital prints that you're dealing with. And I know there's so many variations on paper um, and, and then the, and, and getting in the dark room. Oh, I like somebody saying, Veronica saying used to work with Ilford and Veronica had actually DM'd me and works for with Hanamule papers. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, they are there. It's crazy talk. I, I don't know how many of the teachers are actually teaching it on film, but uh, our classes. So this should be, I'm excited for your answer, Eric. The comparison, Nico, yeah. How old are the students? These are college students, college Cal State students. Northridge. That's yeah, great. Cal State Northridge, CSUN, big freestyle supporter. Um, CSUN, a uh, big Eric supporter. So Eric, what are your, what are your thoughts there? What are your thoughts about, oh, they're not going to have as much fun or um, it, they really have access to papers if they do start thinking about printing digitally that, that will be able to give some of the, you know, the, the sense of it, of, I know it's completely different, but I gave you a big open-ended question. Thank you for answering and thinking about it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> So first of all, um, a lot of people try to get me to take sides, this darkroom versus digital side, right? What's better, darkroom or digital? And I got to tell you, as, you know, as a company, you know, 75% of our sales are still wet darkroom. And, um, or at least they were before COVID. I mean, our primary market is selling 
you know, film, black and white film paper and chemicals to schools, especially schools in California. Um, and we've always felt that, you know, teaching wet darkroom is, you know, is a great skill building uh, class. There's things that you learn in the darkroom that you don't learn digitally. Uh, just the sheer um, experience of seeing that print, you know, emerge on the paper, you know, in the chemicals is is unique um you know we can argue about it but i don't get the same excitement watching a printhead go back and forth in an inkjet printer uh, some people do but i don't i like that you know it's like it's and it, when we talk about darkroom uh, printing in the darkroom we always talk about the magic of the darkroom i mean every single person uses the word magic to describe that experience so yeah, I think right now in COVID, you know, in the, during the pandemic, we have to, you know, there's some sacrifices that have to be made uh, because of social distancing and, 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 and being in the environment. But the reality is uh, when you're able to go into the darkroom, do it, right? I mean, it's, it's an important part of the learning process. Now, um, I, I don't know if we talked about this the other Thursday, but there's a, there's a website called the Ardenberg Imaging, or Ardenberg Imaging. It's run by a guy named Mark McCormick, um, who used to work for Henry Wilhelm, who is- um, Could you spell that? I'll tag uh, it in the chat. Can you spell Ardenberg it? Imaging. In fact, what I will do is I will, um, I will put it in the chat. So, um, so Mark McCormick uh, runs this company. Uh, oops, hold on. Uh, where is everyone? Everyone in meeting. There we go. <laughs> so he has um, a very interesting conversation. I, I really recommend to a lot of people. It's called the Ardenberg Imaging Podcast. And he um, established his own company and own testing methods, his own testing methods for uh, measuring archival permanence of ink and such. And in one of his podcasts, he talks about inkjet printing as a system of printing. And, um, and he has a quote, he says something in there that I quote all the time. Inkjet printing is the great pretender. Okay. And what he means by that is, <laughs> you know, we could make prints on a resin coated paper, glossy, luster, satin, whatever, that look just like prints that came out of a mini lab or from a, a commercial lab from, you know, 20 years ago, or even now, I mean, there's still companies making C prints, chromogenic prints, silver halide emulsion. Now it's exposed with lasers rather than halogen bulbs, but, or, or tungsten bulbs, but, you know, uh, we could make color prints on a resin coated paper or black and white prints on a resin coated paper that look just like those, that type of product. We have papers like um, 100 milli photo rag barita, fine art barita, fine art barita satin, um, uh, Canson platine, Canson barita photographic two, Moab juniper barita. We have lots of papers available to us that can look like a double weight fiber base, black and white darkroom print, or just a really high quality fiber base print. Um, we have matte papers that are uh, smooth and uh, smooth matte or textured or slightly textured or really rough textured that can we can make images that look like you know watercolors or illustrations or drawings or etchings and we have canvas we could make prints on canvas that make images look like oil paintings but the reality is inkjet printing is none of those things and I don't think that um, you could hold I mean if you hold a black and white double weight fiber base print on a, you know, Ilford multigrade four fiber base or now the multigrade five or, or a burger or, you know, any of the historic, you know, fiber base papers, darkroom prints, silver gelatin prints look different in your hand. Now in, in a mat under glass from three or five feet away, maybe you can't really tell the difference, but in your hand, the way light, the way light reflects off of um, those materials is very different. And the feeling that you get when you create your work on these, you know, in the darkroom versus digital, I think is different. So it's really about how it makes you feel. So while you're making a bit of a sacrifice now, 
um, you know, we're going to be out of this soon. And, and when you have the opportunity, get in a dark room and have that experience. You know, you may not continue with it. Um, you know, we certainly have seen a trend of, of um, uh, film sales are, uh, have been maintaining and increasing, especially in COVID. And that means to me that people are buying film, processing it. And if they're printing, they're printing it themselves digitally which is, uh, you know, it's a hybrid approach, you might say, but to me, it's one big happy toolbox. It's not hybrid. If you're shooting film and love that experience and love the look of film and you're scanning it in or shooting it with your DSLR, which is a really popular thing to do now, um, people are using their full frame DSLRs, little copy stand, little backlight, you know, uh, uh, a light panel, mm -hmm. taping their film down or shooting it really high quality, you know, um, you're doing it one at a time. You're not putting in a flatbed scanner, but the quality is great. So um, to me, it's whatever it takes for you to be able to do what you do. Uh, but I can say that in, in printing now, in paper, we have more choices available to us than we ever have in the history of photography. And, and to me, the choice of paper is really where the rubber meets the road. In so with all those choices, what's closest to the old Oriental seagull? Um, toned or not. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, Oriental seagull was a bright white paper mm -hmm. that was, I mean, we call it a cool tone paper, right? So um, papers literally where people have come in and they have a print, right? They have a darkroom print and they go, I want a paper that looks like this. Um, the, uh, the two, uh, the, actually the two papers that I think are closest are Hanamula uh, Fine Art Barita, which is a uh, alpha cellulose base. It has a coating of Barita, which is barium sulfate, mm -hmm. which was used um, in the production and continues to be used in the production of black and white darkroom paper. It's a clay that in the darkroom uh, papers was used as an aid in the mechanical adhesion of the silver gel and emulsion to the paper. And it has a natural optical brightening quality to it. Um, so when UV light hits it, it will project a brighter or bluer white. Um, an Oriental Seagull paper had that bright a coating and it was very white based. Um, uh, so the uh, Hanamili Fine Art Barita, um, I think is a really good match visually. Mm -hmm. uh, Photo Gloss Barita from Hanamule, which is a very um, glossy, high gloss paper, as opposed to the Fine Art Barita, which has got a little bit of a texture to it. Um, Canson Barita Prestige um, is another really good quality product. It's got Barita. Now, all of these papers have Barita and optical brighteners mm -hmm. in them. And they need that because the level of barita and whiteness in Oriental Seagull and the new, you know, the newer Ilford papers is very bright. So they're trying to match the look. Now there's papers like uh, Hanamula Photorag Barita. I'm not saying Hanamula because Veronica's on. I know she's <laughs> on, but these are honest answers, right? Because I he's actually typing in the chat there, asking what about Hanamula Barita FB? Um, Barita FB is not one of my favorite papers. Um, to be honest, Bright FB has bright, a lot of optical brighteners. It also has a bit of a magenta cast to it. Um, it's very thick. I mean, when you compare it to other papers, it has a, a very magenta cast to it, um, but it is popular for black and white. Um, you just can't see it against any other paper because I just say, eh, it looks magenta. Um, so you got to kind of see it on its own. Um, but uh, really, the interesting thing is, is now the market has turned more towards neutral papers and warm papers. So all of the semi-gloss, double weight, you know, uh, 310, 325, 340 GSM papers are designed to remind you of the darkroom and the Barita paper, the, uh, the Barita coatings that are used in the inkjet papers are also designed to remind you of the darkroom because they, Barita has a certain odor to it. And when you open up a pack, it smells just like darkroom paper. Well, so, I just uh, want to let you know, Eric, that we're at two hours. 
I don't know oh how much God, you want really? to talk. I can go on forever. Uh, I, I know. Oh. I mean, I mean, we can go on for for a bit here, but I just want to but the, let you know because you've been doing all the talking. But the Baraita paper isn't that very fragile surface. No. I mean, look, when it comes to all photographic papers ever made, they're all fragile. Um, and inkjet, um, it depends. I mean, you don't want to scratch it. You don't want to put your fingerprints. You want to handle it. But uh, the variety of papers are pretty robust. You know, and I've got, you know, I've got images stacked in a portfolio. I take them all over the country with me, and um, they're pretty durable. I mean, it depends on what your level of sensitivity is, right? I mean, you've got a pure black you know, print with a black background, you're gonna see everything, right? And also, by the way, um, Baraita, it is one of the um, single terms that I run across that people don't seem to be able to know how to pronounce. <laughs> they call it Barita, they call it Barita, they call it Barita, like they're in Harry Potter. Um, they call it the Burrito, <laughs> they call it, they call it Barda. I'll have some so, of that burrito paper. They call it Bayarda. I mean, um, so when I do presentations on paper, I've got a, um, I've got a particular um, uh, program that I do called the World of Inkjet Paper, the Print Matters. And I've spent the last, you know, eight, 10 years traveling all over the country, performing it for colleges and universities and professional photo labs and places of photo, you know, nonprofit, uh, organizations of photo education and museums and galleries and such. And I've ported it now to Zoom. And I actually have a slide where I talk about all of the mispronunciations of the word Barita. What's your favorite paper? Um, if I tell you, I have to kill you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, the way I work is every image has a paper that's right for it. Um, and for me to say, I just have a favorite paper doesn't really work because it depends on the image. I have a group of favorite papers that I personally use all the time, but, um, there isn't just one and there in, in my world, there can't be, I can't have just one paper. So let's say that there is a particular image, a image, right? I'm not going to say what type of an image it is, but an image that you like and you want to uh, you want to print it on a paper a favorite image you want to print on paper what paper okay, i can see you're not going to let me out of this so i'm going <laughs> to no. show you no okay. and, that, and that and that's not that's not the end of it <laughs> okay so here's um so i have a wireless so i can talk when i'm <laughs> walking around here so Okay, so here's an image. Uh, Veronica will recognize this image. Let's see if I can get it in here. Uh, this image up oh, higher. A little to the side. What? Yeah. There you go. No, the other way. Okay. There it is. Okay, so this is an image on William Turner. This is Hanamile William Turner. I will mm -hmm. never print this image on another paper. It is perfect. Um, oh. I think you can see that it looks pretty dimensional, right? Yep. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Now, now, let me take it to the final step. So there's the image that you like on that paper. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what printer would you print it on? Um, well, I pretty much standardized for Canon. So this was printed on a, you know, my Canon Pro 4100 here. Any reason why? It doesn't why? really matter. I mean, they're all great printers. Okay. I mean, Epson makes fine printer. I mean, I'm not going to, you're not going to get me to tell you whether or not Canon or Epson are better. It's irrelevant. It's I'm, no, no, Canon. I wasn't, I wasn't going to ask that. No, no, it's just. I was just going to say, what printer would you print it on? Yeah, it's uh, all my prints are printed on, my entire portfolio is printed on one printer. I don't want to have that level of variation in it. So, you know, I traditionally use Canon printers uh, for my portfolio. And so this image on this paper is perfect. And the reason is that when I shot it, I mean, I probably can get a little closer here. This is an after hours depository drop box that's on the side of a building. And um, the drop box is made out of bronze. The background is um, it's brick and granite or whatever. And this paper is a matte paper with a very heavy texture. It's got the, uh, when you feel it, it feels like 80 grit sandpaper. 
And I knew that the paper was going to accentuate the texture in the background and it was going to make this smooth by comparison. How I knew that was that I have always been obsessed with the camera and photography's ability to represent three dimensional reality on a two dimensional surface and make it seem three dimensional. There's a photographic space that we capture in every image. It's a distortion, right? So mm -hmm. when people see this image on a matte paper with that much texture, it's surprising because they think that I would have printed on a glossy metallic paper. The reality is on that type of paper, it would have looked more photographic. My illusion is much more apparent in this paper than it would be on another paper. So this is the perfect paper for this image. Now, um, this image, this is 190 LaSalle Street in Chicago. And I printed this on, um, thank you, Veronica. I printed this on uh, Innova um, Editions Etching Cotton Rag. Uh, the texture perfectly matches this background texture and are the, are the letters popping off the page? Are they going in? There's a great illusion here. And I would have never been able to capture it on a glossier luster paper. So this is the perfect paper for this particular image. So for me, it's about that pre-visualization and seeing how the image is gonna be different. Here's, um, Here's a digital infrared image. I'm not sure you're really going to be able to tell the difference on a video camera, on, on the video here. But this is Hanamule Fine Art Barita, which would be a great match for Oriental Seagull. But this is the same image on William Turner. And in real life, it looks totally different. William Turner has no OBAs. It's matte. It's textured. It's the same image on two different papers. And it looks like two different images. And I've made a choice here, you know, as to which one I like. But then you get to see which one you like. And this is the type of thing I would do in an inkjet paper psychotherapy session, which is I would take an image and print it on a, you know, up to eight different papers and send them to you. The Hamamil so looks, it looks like different. it's more contrasty compared mm -hmm. to the William Penn. Yes, absolutely. The yeah. fine art variety is going to be more contrasty. It's whiter. It's a little hard to see from how far back you are, Eric. If you can bring a close up portion and kind of lay the images on top of each other, maybe the um, far right of the clouds, well, then I have <coughs> put, to... the, put the other one on top because I think it, there's a good amount of contrast in that corner. Put the other one on top, flip the order. The other one? Yeah, flip the order, right? And, there, show, and then come really close to the camera. I'll be quiet. You, you should all be able to see the clouds. I'm now speaking to my yeah. students. A little bit lower, Eric, go a little bit lower. Okay, perfect. Speak, Eric. So you... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so here, here's Hanamule Fine Art Barita Satin. John, you I can mean, pin him too. So it just shows Yeah, that's Eric Yeah, I'll do that. Yep. So this image is on Hanamule Fine Art Barita Satin, and it's a wall sconce on the side of a wall in a little town in Germany. Mm -hmm. And in, I mean, it just looks super three-dimensional, right? I mean, you really want to push that button. And it looks as three-dimensional in real life. Well, without but the shadow, it, without the shadow, it doesn't look three-dimensional. You know, but the, the, well, the, the, I, I took it with the shadow. Look, it's my image. I did it on purpose. You're right. I, I understand that. Without the shadow, it, it's got the well, shadow. You, can... you can't talk about it without the shadow because it's there. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. So, but the the thing is, it's paper choice, right? It's all about paper choice. Now, here is this is a, a very popular image of mine. Uh, this guy is in Hakone, Japan. This is on Hanamili Photo Rag Satin. And um, he's cooking eggs in a natural hot spring. This is a very volcanic area of, um, let me see, where am I? A uh, very volcanic area in Japan. And what they do is they hard boil chicken eggs and um, sell them to tourists for three for 700 yen. And which sounds like a lot of money, but it's really like seven or $8, depending on the exchange rate. 
And uh, the mythology is that if you eat a black egg, you'll extend your life by seven years. So they sell them, you know, three for 700 yen. And they recommend, uh, the recommendation is that you don't eat more than uh, two and a half because it's apparently dangerous to extend your life by more than uh, um, 17 years. Uh, I ate three and got a stomach ache. So I know why you're not supposed to eat <laughs> more than two and a half, but this is the perfect paper for this image. I would never print it on another paper. And it does have optical brighteners in them, which I generally try to avoid. But, um, but the texture of the paper, which is not really super matte, the ink has a little bit of a gloss sheen to it, even though it's a matte paper. Um, but the way it's rendering the tonality and, and how it's uh, rendering the, the steam coming off in these uh, figures in the background, it's the perfect paper. I would never print it on anything else. But so do, you ever image, do hmm? you ever experiment printing it on other papers? Well, I did when I started all this, right? I've experimented. Now I'm at the pre-visualization stage. Okay. I have the knowledge now and the experience to know what's going to look right. Veronica is uh, asking if you can show one of Cheryl's experience. images. Do hmm? you have one of Cheryl's images there by any chance? Uh, yes. Why? Veronica is asking to see one. Ah, okay. So here's a Cheryl's image. This is on um, Hanamule's photo rag metallic. And it has a beautiful depth and dimension to the color. And it's perfect for this. Now, uh, in full disclosure, Cheryl is a brand ambassador for Canson Infinity. So she prints on Canson Platine. We also have some New Canson papers here that are going to be coming out that we can't talk about, um, but they look really, really super interesting and exciting. Uh, but Cheryl's work, you know, she's allowed to print on other brands of paper for her own work. And this image, um, you know, Cheryl is a very accomplished and well known underwater portrait photographer. Uh, this is one of hers um, images. She shoots underwater. This is underwater. She's underwater. Yes, um, Cheryl was a guest on the show a few weeks ago. So if you go look at my archives, if you want to see that. So this is uh, this is on um, metallic, which is a really uh, unique paper. It's 100% cotton, no optical brighteners. It's got a, a silver metallic coating to it and uh, actually has barita. When you open the pack, it actually does smell like darkroom paper. Um, I got, oh, okay. Um, and then here is, um, you know, a test image, a couple of other Cheryl's images that are on some of the new Canson papers. And I can't tell you what it is. If I tell <laughs> you, they're going to kill me. So, so it's really all about paper choice, but then there's some extreme things here as well. So this is, um, Awagami is a paper line that we brought in from uh, Japan. It's a 300 year old paper mill. People ask me all the time, how can I print on, um, uh, how can I print on uh, tissue paper? And I, you can't because it won't go through the printer. This paper actually, it's uh, the, um, the paper part that you print on is made of Kozo, which is a um, Japanese mulberry bark. It's made in a pulp and it's designed to be peeled from a wood pulp backing and it turns into this which then can be presented as a scroll or a backlight. Mm. And it's very thin, it's very delicate, but it's also very durable because Kozo fibers are very long. And you could make, you know, um, all sorts of things out of it. And so, I like to use them for window hangings and yeah, scroll. That makes me think of the old Duratrans materials. Is there something that you work on that's similar to a Duratrans for backlighting? Uh, in inkjet, the problem with backlight films is um, on the pigment printers, they don't look very good when you backlight mm -hmm. them. They look great when you look at them straight on, but as soon as you put them up to a window, they kind of go flat. So that to me is one of the problems with, uh, with like a Duratrans on inkjet. So that's where the chemical process is still kind of king. You could do things um, with Fuji Flex material, you know, the backlight material that you can't really do with an inkjet material. I haven't really seen an inkjet material that works well 
Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, we're at two hours and 15 minutes or so. We'll I think we can cut it off, right? Probably wrap this one up for today. We could always do a part two at some point. Yeah. But, you know, I hope that this, um, this was helpful to people and I, I appreciate and thank you for having me on. This is uh, something you. I've been looking forward to for a long time. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I love the list of, of really influential, important uh, photographers and resources you've have you've had on since you've started it yeah um let's see on november 5th my friend holger mishke is going to be the host of the show because he wants to interview me so you're going to ah. get me as your guest that day cool uh, so, so that should um, be interesting excellent so i guess um let me put into the chat here this is my email address in case anybody wants to get a hold of me um if anybody's interested in a remote inkjet paper psychotherapy session, um, here's a link to that item on our website. And um, it's the only way I know of to really be able to answer the ultimate question of what paper should I use? And I have access to every paper that we sell, obviously. I'm, you know, one of the adv great advantages for me to working at freestyle photographic supplies is that I have a very large sandbox and I get to play in it all the time. And I have almost unlimited resources and I have access to people like Veronica and Arthur, you know, Veronica with Hanumili and Arthur at, at Canon. And, you know, I'm, you know, I try to make myself available as much as possible to people as, and, um, and, you know, provide kind of a kinder, gentler approach to printing than most people do, I think. And also it's a bit of a unique perspective. So, um, but I will let you know, I am on vacation this week. So don't call me this week, wait till <laughs> next week. <laughs> Yay, good for you to get the vacation. I'm unplug, I have not had any time off. One other Facebook. thing I'm gonna put in there, John, one other thing I'm gonna put in the chat here. Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't able to give the link last time. Uh, we have a chart on our website called the World of Inkjet Paper Comparison Chart. So a lot of things that I'm talking about uh, we didn't get into the GSM, we didn't get into optical brighteners, we didn't get into all that stuff, but we've created a chart that is a full listing of every paper we have uh, in inventory and what its characteristics are. It's sortable and it is searchable as well. I went to it last time and it's terrific. It's a great resource. We put a lot yeah. of time into it and it will be continually updated. So, okay, I'm exhausted now. Okay, I mean, I well, thank you all for attending. Thank I'm going to stop the recording. If people want to stay on for a couple of minutes, they can do so.